Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we have about 280 registrants from 35 states and 19 countries, including Canada and the UK and Israel and Argentina, China, India, Kuwait, Poland, and France, to name a few, uh, for tonight's town hall. And so this town hall, after we record it tonight, it'll be available on our YouTube channel in a couple of days. So if you uh, miss anything, come back to our YouTube channel and uh, you can listen to it again. Um, I especially want to say thank you to our sponsors, to ASI and Exelixis and Merck, and all the folks like you that are listening tonight that have contributed to kidney cancer. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's really my pleasure tonight to thank our panelists, uh, Dr. Brian Reedy from Vanderbilt University Medical Center, as well as Dr. Tom Powell's at Bart's Cancer Center in the UK. Um, a quick uh, public service announcement, sort of a plug, I guess, for Kidney Can. Um, Kidney Can's partnered with the AACR, the American Association for Cancer Research. Um, and today we are, we are proud to announce that we have two $50,000 career investigator, early career investigator awards with a push towards novel targets and or biomarkers. And so um, if you could tell any of the, the folks in the young, younger career investigators that you know out there, please apply. Um, the information is all there on our web, on the website. Um, but now, you know, it's my distinct pr privilege and honor to introduce two leaders in the kidney cancer and urology ecosystem. Um, first of all, for those who don't know, Dr. Brian Reedy's here. Um, he's also um, a swimmer and uh, swims with his Notre Dame swim team across Lake Tahoe every summer. So something to talk to him about next time. And also um, our, our good friend from across the ocean, Dr. Tom Powell's Unfortunately for Dr. Powell, he still has been misinformed about the American Revolution and its true history, but we're going to try to work on him on, on that. But I'm going to get out of the way right now. Thank you both for being here. Looking forward to hearing from the Euro Amigos. Dr. Reedy, the floor is yours. Thanks, Brian. I appreciate it. It's great to be here. I know I speak on behalf of Tom. And so um, what we're going to do tonight, and, and this is really meant to be very conversational, is the first half or so, I'll present a little bit of data about uh, major data in kidney cancer that's come out in the last year, and Tom and I will sort of discuss as we do uh, often on our podcast, and we're happy to be interrupted with questions in the chat or whatnot. We'll try to keep track of them. Um, and then we'll, I think there's some questions from you all, and then we'll turn and Tom will talk a little bit about what's coming in the next year, so sort of big data sets that we're looking forward to. And uh, let's see, you can see my screen, I assume, Brian, all good? Yeah, we're good, Brian. There we go. Thanks, Tom. Um, by the way, thanks to Kidney Can for the great graphics. This this is a way better production than Tom and I could ever do. It's so true. Thanks. Our meetings are disaster. <laughs> <laughs> Best part, I have my Wayland Jennings shirt on. So thank you very much for that. So let's see here. So I'm basically going to talk about three topics. First is adjuvant therapy. There's some big data presented uh, just recently with pembrolizumab. I'll talk a little bit about frontline therapy, although we haven't had a lot of new data. I think it's a topic we should cover. And then I'll talk about belzutifan, which was approved just, I don't know, was that two months ago or something, not even in the refractory setting. Um, so let's start with, with adjuvant therapy. This is a study that, that Tom was involved in. The history of adjuvant therapy in kidney cancer is very checkered. There's been a lot of things tried and nothing that's really worked until recently. Keno 564 is a big study that you see here where patients with uh, localized kidney cancer, but at high risk for recurrence, and that's some of those middle bullet points on the left there, um, after their surgery were randomized to either get a year of pembrolizumab, as you may know, it's a PD-1 inhibitor, a type of immune therapy or placebo, and we never like to give placebo, but in fact, that was the standard of care in this disease at the time, i.e. just getting scans and not getting any therapy. And what was seen initially was, I think I have it here, is uh, what's called a disease-free survival benefit. So um, what these curves represent is obviously the top curve is patients who got the immune therapy, the bottom curve is patients who got placebo. And what we'd like to see in these curves is, is them go straight across the top, right? We'd like to have no patient recur out to, you can see the number of months at the bottom there, so over many years. But when you're comparing two things, you want to obviously see an intervention do better. You want the curves to, to separate, as we would say, and, and one group to do better. In this case, the group that dr got drug, which was the case. Tom and I talk a lot about what's called hazard ratios. It's kind of what's your risk of having an event, in this case, a disease recurrence event, i.e. what's the chance of your scans becoming worse at some point? And that hazard ratio of 0.7 means there's about a 30% reduction in the rate of recurrence for patients who get pembrolizumab. These data were actually first presented 
helped me out, Tom, probably about a year ago. I think it was ASCO GU, not this year, but the year prior. Um, but the reason I'm bringing it up tonight is that um, and it was FDA approved on that basis around that time. The, the reason I'm bringing it up tonight is that just a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, there was data on overall survival. So the, the previous curves were how long did patients live until disease came back? This, these curves, as the name would imply, is just how long do patients live, right? And it's been, it's been very tricky to show an overall survival advantage um, in this setting for a number of reasons. Number one, not everybody recurs, thankfully. And number two, we have a number of drugs in the advanced setting that we use um, that are shown to prolong life. But so this is a this is a big deal. This is a major sort of event, watershed event in the world of kidney cancer. And it really just reinforces the use of this drug in this setting. Every patient, there are risks, and we can sort of talk about that. But I but these are, you know, it's probably the biggest data in kidney cancer, I would say, in the last year. Uh, again, we'll talk about some others, but I think these are the biggest data. Let me let me pause there and, and Tom just give you a chance to give your perspective. Obviously, you were involved with this trial. Um, anything else you want to add just in terms of description of the summary, as I said? No, I think it is, as you say, it is a watershed moment, but with watershed moments, there needs to be discussion um, around criticisms, shortcomings, limitations. Um, and um, and as we change our mindsets around this, um, because there have been a lot of other trials in the same space that haven't worked, we haven't explained why pembrolizumab was successful and nivolumab was not successful, number one. And number two is we have to recognize that in the control arm, not all the patients are relapsing. So surgery cures the majority of patients and I describe the adjuvant period as sort of the icing on the cake of this. The important thing is you get a successful operation, and the result of that operation is by far the most important issue. But the question now, uh, well, the, 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 for me, the dialogue with patients has moved from um, we can reduce the risk of the cancer coming back, but, but we might be able to salvage you with subsequent therapy, and we don't yet know if that results in a survival perspective, that dialogue's changed to uh, we can reduce the risk of the cancer coming back. And at five years' time, there's an absolute, about a 5% absolute reduction in the death rate. And that, I think, is important. <clears throat> the caveat, of course, is there's a 10% chance of life-changing toxicity, ranging from diarrhea, lung disease, pneumonitis, all sorts. And you can, you know, have these chronic colitis type pictures. So, you know, long-term side effects of immune therapy is possible. So I, this graph does not mean that all patients must have adjuvant therapy. It's a high-risk population, number one. Number two is there are still caveats associated with receiving treatment and indeed side effects. And although this trial is positive, and I agree it is a watershed moment, we need to explain why some other trials were negative in this space as well on drugs, which after all are very similar. Yeah, so what Tom's alluding to, there were three other trials that have been reported and a fourth one yet to be reported that were similar in design to this one, not identical in different drugs and, and some various differences that did not show any difference in, in any endpoint. So it showed absolutely no benefit in essence. And so the field is scratching its head a little bit about why was this one drug in this one trial so successful and the others weren't. I don't think anybody has a great explanation, right? We can explain things and do some hand-waving, but I don't think anyone really understands why there are differences. And, uh, you know, as I usually tell my fellows, any one trial is an estimation of the truth, right? It's not the whole truth. It's it's an estimation of it. So, we, you know, it's, and, and the other thing I think that, Tom, what you're getting to is I know I think this way for every patient and every decision, it's benefit and risk, right? What's the benefit? What good can I do to this patient and what harm can I do? And does the good generally outweigh the harm? And that's different for different patients. So Tom talked about, you know, a 5% increase in survival. You see that 48 month curve. And if you go back to the disease-free survival, about an 8% difference in rate of recurrence. So, you know, significant and definitely lower not massively lower. It doesn't, you know, cut your risk in half. It doesn't lower it by 20%, um, but, but definitely a benefit. And, and, you know, many and most patients obviously are willing to do anything they can to reduce that risk. But, you know, what's, what I don't have slides on, but Tom rightly mentions is, is side effects. 
And the way I explain it to patients is most patients tolerate this drug fine, you know, seven or eight out of 10 patients tolerate it fine, but one or two can have, you know, more severe, even lifelong side effects or requiring steroids. And if you're in that one or two, then it's a very serious thing. Um, and then maybe just, just to state it, you know, as Tom said, not, not every patient in this circumstance will have recurrence. You know, you can see the recurrence rate, even for patients who did nothing, you know, um, would be 100 minus that, right? So 44, 43%. Um, so there's plenty of patients who are cured with surgery alone. And, and again, it makes this population very different than the advanced setting where patients definitely have recurrence that we'll talk about next. That's a very different, in my mind, sort of benefit risk discussion and, and decision making. Um, anything else to add there, Tom? I don't know if there's I think questions. You're doing a, I think you're doing a great job, Brian. That's all I've got to say. Um, I'm, let me just look at the chat real quick about questions. Were you expecting a greater absolute difference? I don't know. I mean, based on the other trials, I don't know that we were expecting any difference. So we would always like to see greater differences, right? Nobody's rooting for more positive trials than folks like us who do these trials or, or docs who treat patients. So, you know, when you look at the absolute difference, those numbers aren't as impressive. I will say these, these hazard ratio numbers in the 0.6 and 0.7 range are about as good as it gets. You don't see too many trials in the cancer space, certainly not in the adjuvant space that have as good of results. So it's, it's the difference between relative and absolute. Go ahead, Tom. Right. I just, you know, one of the observations from a distance, and you and I have chatted about this on many occasions, um, we are taking with us, we are giving many patients adjuvant therapy, as you've said, who don't need it. And actually, when you consider how many patients here don't relapse, and half of them are not relapsing, for those at risk who are going to relapse, the difference really is quite striking. And if we were able to remove that 50%, which we're not going to relapse, and only focus on the at-risk population, these data would be even better. And the hazard ratios and the absolute differences would be very, very large indeed. So I think that there is a piece of work here in the future, which is to identify the patients who are really at risk of the cancer coming back. At the moment, the way we do that is fairly crude. We basically look at the size of the cancer that's cut out in a pot. We measure it. And if it's more than a certain size or there's lymph node involvement, we say that's high risk. But we know that the biology of cancer is much more complicated than that. And there are subgroups in whom the cancer is likely to come back. And indeed, we can now even measure in the blood, um, blood tests, which can show us those patients at increased risk. So I think this is the first piece of a two-piece jigsaw. We've now identified a drug which can reduce the risk of the cancer coming back and pa make patients live longer. The next piece is how do we stop those patients who are not at risk having this therapy which is potentially harmful. Yeah, I would just say what Tom's getting at is, you know, biomarkers to select patients who are really at risk. You know, again, as Tom mentioned, the, the algorithms to estimate risk of recurrence are 20 plus years old. We don't really have any modern algorithms, honestly. Um, and there's efforts by Tom and others in bladder cancer to look at circulating tumor cells. It's not as successful or advanced in kidney cancer. So we're not there from a practical, your doctor can use it in clinic, but from a research standpoint, we're always trying to narrow the population of patients who receive drugs that are potentially harmful. Um, okay, bunch of questions. I won't get to them all, but let me just go through here real quick. Are there adjuvant trials adding a VEGF inhibitor to the IO regimen or VEGF inhibitor by itself? There was a whole generation of VEGF inhibitor by itself that, to summarize, 10 years of data didn't work. That, that, that giving VEGF inhibitors by itself basically does not work to prevent recurrence. Adding a VEGF inhibitor to IO, I think there's actually one trial pending, but um, my belief is that, you know, one plus zero equals one. So I, if, if the IO works, but the VEGF doesn't, there's not a lot of rationale to add. It's a, it's a complicated question, but the short answer is that VEGF plus IO in the adjuvant setting has not been adequately tested, although I'm aware of plans for one trial. Um, there's um there is a there is the HIF inhibitor study, so there is a pembrolizumab plus or minus belzutifan in the adjuvant setting, um, which uh, is enrolling at the moment. But I think it's going to complete its enrollment fairly soon. Yeah, um, it may come back to your point previously, Brian. Although I think belzutifan is a better tolerated agent than um, than a VEGF TKI, and therefore is a better mm -hmm. agent suited to the adjuvant setting. 
it, it's not clear that that you if know, it works. It's, it's not clear if it's going to work in the adjuvant setting. Yes. Yeah, there's controversy over that. Somebody asked to explain hazard ratio in patient language. I, I, I tried, but unsuccessfully. So a hazard ratio, let's say, of 0.7 means there's a 30% risk of reduction. If the hazard ratio is 1 between drug A and drug B, it means there's absolutely no difference in outcome. If the hazard ratio is below 1, it means the drug had that much benefit. So you're looking at 0.72 on the screen here. That means there's a 28% risk of reduction of recurrence at any point along the curve. It's not just one point in time. It's the whole period of time that patients have been followed. Um, plenty of docs don't understand that either. So you're in good company. It's essentially uh, the air, it's essentially the area it's, between it's the area green between these and groups. the green. Yeah. yeah. Between the green and the red divided by the area um, between the red and the top. That makes it uh, crystal clear. Thank you. Tom. I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> I, I should go. I really apologize. <laughs> There's no food, just, no more math in this presentation. Yeah. I promise you. No, I, somebody I, asked no. about. Yeah, asked about. Can can you speak about subsequent treatments that patients receive depending on where they live in the world and how that might have affected OS? This is a really complicated topic. Tom and I just did a podcast with Hans Hammers from UT Southwestern, and Tom and Hans sort of debated some of these results. It's it's a pretty, you know, down the rabbit hole in the weeds type of podcast, but I, I don't think we've released it yet, but I might point you to that. Um, how long people live in this study is, is a function of perhaps of what therapies they had access to. And while in the U.S. we have access to everything, that's clearly not true around the world, right? So the question is really around if there was an imbalance. And let's say a lot of the placebo patients didn't have access to life prolonging drugs that could affect these results. The short answer is we don't really know. We have some high-level data, but we don't have granular data about individual patients and what exact drugs they got and were they the patients who, who lived or not or had recurrence. So it's important information. I don't think we'll have it anytime soon, but it's, it's a whole area of controversy around these data. Can I, can I say my opinion on this, Brian? Please. Yeah. So look, this is where I'm, because I'm thinking more about this as time goes by. I think that um, I don't think there's a huge amount of evidence that the addition of IPI to single agent immune checkpoint inhibition makes a huge difference. But I do think if you've got metastatic kidney cancer, I think having early immune checkpoint inhibition is a good idea. Um, and so I think having it up front in the adjuvant setting is a really good idea because I think it's probably the best way of prolonging survival. The yeah. challenge, the challenge is that we're over treating the population. So Hans's point is says, yes, Tom, you're absolutely right. If you knew all these patients were going to relapse, give it immediately. And that's fabulous. And then, you know, you won't need to worry because some people say, well, maybe patients will relapse and it's going to be really aggressive cancer. It's going to be too late. They may not get the chance to get a good response to immune therapy. And I think that's a fair point. So I think this principle of saying giving it early is great. But the problem is, and Hans's point, which is correct, is we're bringing in a whole lot of patients with us who don't need it. Yeah. We're putting those patients in harm's way. So, yes, the patients, there's a group of patients who are getting early therapy who are probably benefiting a bit. But is that outweighing the harm we're doing to those group of patients that don't need the therapy? And how many of those patients in whom we gave it too early could we salvage by giving it later? And if we're not giving it to everyone later, how do we know that's right? And I think that's a summary of what Hans' is position. I don't completely agree with him, um, but uh, but I think that's where he sat, where he stands. Thanks. I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to answer two quick questions. And then, Caroline, I know you're going to ask a question. I'll, we're about halfway through the looking back part, by the way, but I'll, you can ask your question. Give me one second. Somebody asked about non-clear cell adjuvant trials. Um, uh, Tom, are you aware of any non-clear cell adjuvant trials? Some there of is one allowed non-clear cell. There is one enrolling slowly, and there's a study called Rampart in the UK: duvalimab, duvalimab, tremolimumab versus best supportive care, which is enrolled, but it's not, it's closed early because of access to subsequent therapy. Um, and uh, and uh, the position, my position on this is very black and white: is that there be a string of negative adjuvant trials in the history of time. And assuming just because clear cell is positive, that papillary pembrolizumab is also going to be positive, is a leap far too far for me. You're not treating patients with non-clear cell with adjuvant treatment? Definitely not. I yes, think it's the wrong thing to do. I agree. Okay. We, we agree Here, very rarely, Brian. Yes. 
All right. There's a lot of good questions in here. I won't be able to answer. Caroline, why don't you unmute? Sorry to keep you waiting. That's all right. Thank you. Um, I'm excited to be here today, uh, Tom. I'm from London originally, but I live in Maine in the U.S. and I'm treated. You're very lucky. You're Boston, very lucky. I know. Well, a lot of <laughs> snow here at the moment, and I hear yeah. there are snowdrops and daffodils in London. There but... are indeed. There are indeed. It's beautiful here. <laughs> Good. Well, my dad died of kidney cancer in London oh, in 2007. Thank you. And two and a half years later, I was diagnosed with kidney cancer here in Maine. I'd lived here 30 years at the time. This was in 2010. Um, so I'm really interested to know how much progress has been made to explain the causation of kidney cancer. Um, I'd say very little, unfortunately. You know, <clears throat> most patients don't have risk factors. Most kidney cancer is not inherited. Um, smoking is a risk factor. There's chemical exposures, which are risk factors. Um, probably other things I'm not thinking of, Tom. But, you know, it's most people, we can't say, aha, we know why you developed this cancer. It's probably the most common question. Mm -hmm. um, but it's one that I think we, we have a, don't have a great answer to. And, and honestly, I'm not aware, Tom can correct me, of, of any sort of recent data that would, you know, around causation, around etiology. Tom, are no, you aware of no, I think there's been some nice work on the biology of the disease, and we know that there are some powerful driver mutations, mm -hmm. um, and we know that there is some clonal evolution of the cancer, and, uh, and we know that process is perhaps less complicated. Um, the, tu the tumor is not, um, it's not a, a mutationally very complicated cancer. Uh, they're not, it has a relatively low mutational burden. Um, but we know that there are some really powerful key drivers that most, but not all patients have. And mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is, you know, proving causation is really hard to do. And Tom and I are not epidemiologists, I, I, you know, but um, number one, it's a more rare disease. So you need a lot of cases and a lot of causes, mm -hmm. if you will, to show that some, you know, A causes B. And when you have a more rare disease, it, it becomes difficult. Um, even in common diseases, prostate cancer, breast cancer, you know, even in more common malignancies, I think there's, you know, probably relatively little known and, and even less in kidney cancer. So it's a good question, but I'm, you know, and, uh, for most patients, we don't have a good answer. Hey, all right, I'm going to move on just to make sure I give Tom time. There's tons of questions in here. Let me go. So I just, so there's not a lot of new data for, um, frontline treatment. So now we've moved from the adjuvant setting. I got my kidney cut out. Should I get drug or not? Now, unfortunately, we're in the setting of my kidney cancers come back or I walked in the door with kidney cancer that has spread. What did I do? I imagine you're all familiar with basically four regimens that have been shown to make patients live longer that are FDA approved in this setting. The one on the screen is Ipinevo. So two different immune drugs. And then there are three other ones, which are one immune drug and one of the VEGF pills, one of the VEGF TKIs. This was just data presented a couple weeks ago, and it's eight-year follow-up. So these trials are getting quite old now, which is a, a good thing in the sense that we can say uh, what happens to patients long-term. And I think I would just point out, so PFS is progression-free survival. How long does a patient live without their cancer getting worse? And you can see at that uh, eight-year mark, it's, it's about 23%. So about a quarter of patients, when they start this Ipinevo drug, about a quarter of them will be alive with disease that's under control, which means a lot of various things, but it at least is not worse at that time point. And it's, it's, a, it's a particularly impressive feature of this regimen. You know that um, the, the good news about immune therapy is if you're in the group of patients who respond, those patients tend to continue to respond, not all of them and not forever necessarily. I do think some patients are cured. I don't know if all 23% of these patients are what we would call curative disease, but um, I think I would say that eight years is is good long-term disease control, especially back in whenever that was, 2015, when this trial started or so. And then maybe just one more slide, and then I'll ask you to comment, Tom. This is the latest update for the regimen called Axipembro. So Pembro, the drug we talked about in the ad adjuvant setting, plus Axitinib, which is one of the VEGF TKIs you're familiar with. And you can see this is only five-year follow-up, so it's about three years behind the previous slide. And you can see about 18% of patients, this top green number here that I'm circling, if you can see it, are alive and progression-free. So there are patients who start treatment who can get long-term you know, disease control in response to these regimens. And what you know, we argue about in our kidney cancer nerd circles is 
which one does that better? Or, you know, do you need two immune drugs? Can you get away with one? You know, and that's, those are sort of the, the discussions we get into, but I think Tom and I agree that any of the approved regimens are appropriate um, for use. And it really just depends on the patient and the doc and, and various things that we can talk about if we have time. Tom, anything to add about the frontline space? Yeah, I think that if you spend a lot of time thinking and reading about this, you can maybe make patterns where they don't exist. Essentially, there are four regimes. As I see it, what I said before is probably true. It looks like having immune therapy early in your journey is important. And the addition of whether that's an oral VEGF targeted therapy or ipilimumab, ipinevo, probably in the grand scale of things doesn't make that much difference. Um, but I think we in the academic community, because we haven't got more exciting things to talk about, probably have overcomplicated it a bit. And that's not helped because the EMA and FDA have given restricted labels. But essentially, it's much more important right now about having a good medical team that's given the drugs and has experience of the drugs, that you've got good support networks, good management of toxicity. That's a much more important decision than whether you've got good risk disease and get epinevo or whether you've got poor risk disease and get, you know, VEGF, TK, CAVO, NEVO. Those decisions, for me, have become somewhat academic. The really important thing is if you're fit and well and not contraindicated, having early PD-1 inhibition is important and having an experienced team is really important too. So uh, one question that I thought was really good said, would the curve look different if IO was continued to four years? So in, it's a great question. We don't, the answer is we don't really know. In all these trials, the immune therapy component, the infusion was stopped at two years. Why two years? I'm not really sure. I think um, ipilimumab, which was part of the ipinevo regimen, was developed in melanoma first, and BMS, who made the drug, decided to stop that at two years. And so every drug and every trial since has stopped the infusion at two years. And the thought is, of course, once you've generated an immune response, you shouldn't have to continue the drug, right? Just like a vaccine generates an immune response, you know, that persists, same thing here. But nobody really knows if that's the case. I stop at two years in my practice, um, but but it's a good question. And unfortunately, we'll never have trials that test one year versus two years versus four. Those just, they aren't the kind of trials that we tend to do. Not that it's not important, but they're really difficult and long and expensive to do. And so it's the kind of thing that, you know, every doc has a little different take on it. But I think most people stop at two years. But to answer your question, we don't really know. And I think, I think it's fair. I think it's fair to say, I think it's fair to say that stopping at two years does not seem to be associated with a big detrimental problem. I agree. think it, everything yeah, we agree. have in front of us suggests it's safe to do that. I can understand why some patients may not want to do it. But I think part of that comes down to the consent process at the beginning. And if you said, look, because these drugs are supposed to re-educate T cells and that's supposed to be long term. And, and actually being on drugs for the rest of your life is not that great. And I think at some point you do need to stop. Um, and let's say you might say that's easy for me to say because I'm not on these drugs for the life changing cancer. So, um, but at the moment, I think it's fair to say that there is no clear detriment associated with stopping at two years. Agreed. All right, we're going to do two questions and then I'll finish up my part. Um, I think, Bruce, you're first. I might be wrong, but you're right on my screen. <laughs> okay, no problem. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so, you know, with the fast pace of advancements in treatment, how does the latest information get disseminated to local oncologists and patients, um, you know, away from the research facilities? And then, you know, and that would include survival rate changes that, you know, have, have certainly changed in, several, in the last several years. Um, well, we hope it gets to them through our podcast, but that's not always true. I mean, people, you know, the way people receive or disseminate medical information is a whole big topic in business into itself, right? And, you know, if I'm a community doc taking care of every single cancer and not just kidney, it's really hard to keep up, right? So sometimes it's going to meetings, sometimes it's podcasts, sometimes there's, you know, continuing medical education, CME events. I mean, there's a hundred different ways and people learn in different ways. So I don't, I don't know that I have one answer, but um, kidney cancer being a rare disease, you know, and obviously we're biased because we're experts, you know, people need an expert opinion doesn't mean they need to get their treatment with an expert. I see plenty of people that I send back to the community to, to, you know, execute the treatment, so to speak. 
But, you know, a lot of what I do in my spare time, I'm sure Tom does it is, you know, somebody's aunt has breast cancer and doesn't know where to go, or my friend's cousin has this cancer. And I just, I'm trying to get them to somebody with knowledge, right? To at least generate a plan and then figure out where to go, right? The medical system is this opaque black box that's hard to figure out. I don't have to tell all you, even if you're in it, it's hard to figure out, right? So it's a, it's a really good question. I don't, I don't have a, a great answer, but it's, it's all sorts of different ways. I don't know if that answered it, but. Yeah, thank you. Great. All right, Tracy, you're up. Okay, hi, good evening, and thank you. We've sort of alluded to this several times, but I'm asking a question on behalf of Courtney from Alabama, and she'd like to have you address the importance of uh, patients seeing a kidney cancer specialist to help with their treatment decisions. I mean, again, I'm, I'm biased because I am one, but it's absolutely critical, right? I mean, and it, it's true for anything. It's, um, again, you don't need to necessarily, if you have to travel three hours to an academic center to an expert, you don't necessarily need to get treatment through that person. Although there's expertise in giving these drugs, right? So what I tell patients is like, you need to be comfortable with the person treating you, right? And that might be me. It might be somebody else. It might be your local doc, but you need to have comfort that they know what they're doing, that they've done it before and that, you know, they have your best interests at heart, et cetera. And so that's a really complex question. Some people don't have the resources, right, to travel and they don't have the, meet, you know, and so there's all sorts of complexities there, but like anything in life, a high, you know, it starts with a high level of knowledge, right? And so again, we're, we're totally biased, but I think, you know, for some people I'll just see periodically, they're getting treatment locally and I'll just see them with each scan or if they have a problem. So they can't come to see me all the time, but they can check in, you know, periodically and it provides some, some level of comfort. Mm -hmm. All right, let me finish in the interest of time. Let me go to Bell Zutafan. Thank you. There's like a, a hundred amazing questions in the chat I can't get to. So I won't go through the, the biology of kidney cancer is sort of on this slide, but you're probably familiar with von Hippel-Lindau mutations. You're familiar with VEGF expression from our old drugs. Bell Zutafan kind of fits in the middle. So it's a, what we call small molecule. So it's a pill and it's a transcription inhibitor. So transcription is where... Um, basically, DNA gets turned into RNA, right? It's, it's the genes. It's the expression of your, your genetic material. And it's the first such drug to be developed in any cancer. It's been around for a while, but, but just recently approved in kidney cancer. And it works as the diagram would suggest. It's what's called a HIF inhibitor. And HIF is hypoxia-inducible factor. And without going down the rabbit hole of biology, it basically, it targets a key pathway in kidney cancer. Uh, there was a study presented at last year's European meeting called 005 that we usually you'll hear it referred to. And it was the first study of this, the first big study of this drug, but clearly not the last. Tom mentioned one in the adjuvant setting. So it was Belzutafan as the name versus Everlimus, which is a um, older pill that inhibits a different protein that has some utility in kidney cancer. It's not the most potent drug, but can be used in this uh, refractory setting. So these were advanced kidney cancer patients who had at least one or up to three prior regimens. Most of these patients had gotten uh, two to three prior regimens, again, basically just comparing these drugs. And on the left is that, that curve of progression-free survival. So how long until the cancer gets worse? And you could see the, um, the Belzutifan, this top curve here starts to separate, not right away. So up to six months, these curves are basically overlapping. But as you get later in time, you start to see the advantage, you know, to this drug. No difference yet in overall survival. So we're not sure that this drug makes patients live longer. But we can say with confidence, and again, going back to the hazard ratio, that there's about a 26% reduction in the risk of progression by getting this drug. And that's a, it's a, again, a, a decent result for the, for the PF, what we call the PFS hazard ratio. So these data led to approval in the US, I think it was mid December of last year. Um, this is actually data Tom presented, but it's, it's quality of life data. I'm not, I don't have any data on the toxicity of the drug, any slides on it. But one unique feature of this drug is it's really well tolerated. It's, I think, without question, the best tolerated drug that's approved in kidney cancer. Um, it doesn't have the VEGF TKI side effects to the same degree of fatigue and diarrhea and hand foot syndrome and mucositis and uh, things you may be familiar with. It can cause some fatigue and some anemia, you know, and there certainly are side effects, but it, it's generally well tolerated over long periods. And this, this was just data that looked at some quality of life questionnaires, and it's probably... Um, without sort of diving into the details here, that top line is from Belzutafan. And you can see, I think that the markings on the right really explain it, that those patients had 
stability of their symptoms of their quality of life scores, whereas on the other drug, they tended to, to dip down. And I think this is it's same data, but it's expressed differently. Basically, you know, the again, the Belzutifan, the newer drug versus the older drug, newer drug in green, and, you know, how many patients got better over time were the same or deteriorated. And these the two different sets are two different questionnaires. So more patients with improvement, which is basically the bottom line. And this is quality of life questionnaires are a whole topic in and of itself, but it's really a, a reflection of how well tolerated a drug is. And also how much does it control disease, right? Because patients are symptomatic from disease, but also from the treatment as, as you all may know well. I'm going to skip that. So uh, Tom, anything to add about Belzutifan? It's approved in the US. Uh, it's not approved by EMEA yet, right, Tom? Um, no. Um, I mean, I, I think you've done a great job with it, Ron. Just so maybe some of the combination data in the front. Or maybe I'll, I'll, I can talk about that if you like. Yeah, I think um, there are a bunch of trials going on sort of in the looking forward part. This is just the first trial of this drug given by itself. But there's, there's going to be a whole lot of more data over the next several years with this drug. And then, Tom, do you want me to cover non-clear cell real quick? Yeah, cool. I'm far away. All right. We don't have a lot of time. I want to make sure Tom gets time. But there were a lot of questions in the, the pre-questions that we got about non-clear cell. This is a super busy slide, but it's basically all of many of the regimens we use in clear cell and what's called the waterfall plots of their activity in non-clear cell. So waterfall, obviously, for obvious reasons, you know, bars going down are a good thing. It means patients' tumors are shrinking. And it really just shows that many of the regimens we use in clear cell also have activity in non-clear cell. They're probably not as active, but there aren't any drugs specifically approved for papillary kidney cancer or non-clear cell in general. So what we tend to do, and this isn't a perfect way to do it, but what we tend to do is apply the clear cell regimens to non-clear cell. And there's some activity, but it's a whole topic in and of itself that we, we definitely need better drugs for non-clear cell. All right, let me, Tom, why don't you go and I'll sort of gather some questions. Brian, do you think the combination of tablets and injections, the VEGF targeted therapies and the PD-1 therapies are better than the single agent tablets? Yeah, it's never in... been tested in non-clear cell, but I believe so. And that's, I use one of these regimens. I tend to use Lenpember on the bottom right for non-clear cell. Um, there, but non-clear cells are, you know, a rare subset of a relatively rare disease. So we don't have the ability to do really large trials. Although I will say in the last five years, we, the research community, has done a better job of doing trials for this patient population. Not a perfect job, but better than 20 years ago, let's say. I agree with that. I think so far, I mean, so um, a couple of things for me, uh, I'll be brief, because um, I think there are 70 questions. And I think we should try and get through those, Brian, if we can. Um, I've been asked to talk briefly about the future. And I think the first thing to say is that kidney cancer has had an extraordinary decade or perhaps 15 years. Um, I remember um, when the median survival was around 12 months, and it's now close to five years. And that's happened over a period of 15 years, and that's huge progress. Um, and there have been two main reasons for that, the VEGF-targeted therapies and the PD-1-based therapies. And combining them together and giving them early seems to be better than waiting till things get very serious. One of the challenges we have is you'll see we've developed many drugs, but we've developed a lot of drugs which you could say are me two drugs in that nivolumab and pembrolizumab has more similarities and differences. And indeed, tivozinib and excitinib are very similar agents too. And essentially, when you boil it down, we have two really good classes of therapies um, targeting angiogenesis and targeting T cells um, and augmenting T cells. And that's hasn't been advanced and we haven't got that many trials or that many promising drugs beyond those two targets currently um, which look like they're going to change practice so we have some randomized phase three studies we've looked at triplet trials um, they've not been as successful as we would like we've got more triplet trials coming through so that's um, either dual immune with single VEGF or dual VEGF with single immune. In fact, one of them is HIF VEGF. But the reality is that the question there is, if you give everything at the beginning, is it better? And sometimes in cancer medicine, in prostate cancer, for example, that works. 
Um, Brian talked about a plethora of studies looking at belzutifan, and I think that's important. I think it's important to mention one in one big negative trial, which is called CONTACT3. Uh, in CONTACT3, we tested whether re-challenging with PD-1, with immune therapy, um, was effective. And we showed it was very ineffective. And in fact, it was more toxic with no difference. And that suggests to us what I said previously, is you get one good go at immune therapy, probably best to do it at the beginning. And there's no evidence that re-challenging once immune therapies fail is a good idea. So in essence, what we have now is one good go at immune therapy up front, the addition of a second drug, and VEGF-targeted therapy, which can go on for many years, but is largely supportive. It doesn't cure that many patients. Um, where do we go from here? Well, I think there are two or three things that we need to think about. The first is, do we have a new, a new immune target? And there are second generation of immune checkpoints, LAG3, uh, TIGIT, um, other drugs as well. Those drugs seem to work in lung a little bit, and if certainly LAG3 in melanoma. Um, we don't have evidence for them working well currently in kidney cancer. It's funny we haven't generated that data. You'd have thought it would be one of the first places to test immune checkpoint inhibition or second generation immune checkpoint inhibition. And we've not done that. And that's not clear to me why we haven't been more successful. And I have to say that's not through lack of effort between Brian, myself and other people. It's been very hard to persuade the people who own the drugs to test them in kidney cancer, which has been disappointing. Um, I think Roche have got a good study. Uh, and, uh, and I know that BMS and others have drugs that they could use. Uh, I think the next area to talk about is, are there new VEGF-targeted or angiogenic drugs? And there are more HIF inhibitors, but the likelihood is that the newer HIF inhibitors will be more similar more similar than different to the original Belzutifan. So I wouldn't expect a new HIF inhibitor to come out and, and cure kidney cancer as it currently stands. Don't get me wrong, I think Belzutifan is a good drug, and I think it's going to be hard to beat. And so then one needs to look at new areas. And one of those new areas, which I think is exciting, is personalized cancer vaccines. Um, we know um, that uh, the, COVID vaccine, the COVID vaccine was actually originally from BioNTech and from Moderna. They really were designed as cancer vaccines. Essentially, you get a cancer, you mash it up, you find the mutations, and then you inject um, those mutations back into a patient to generate T cells. Essentially, I'm making a complex process sound simple. And so essentially, you're priming the immune system to attack the cancer. Um, and the reason why it's good to do it in the blood and not the cancer is inside the cancer itself, the tumor microenvironment is really immune suppressive. So if you just stick it in the lymph nodes, it's likely that those lymph nodes are going to that they'll be sort of schools of T cells that they can learn how to fight the cancer, and then those armies will be deployed into the cancer. So it's a case of uh, an exciting area. My personal feeling is cancer vaccines haven't been huge, hugely successful over the years, but nevertheless, there's really promising data in pancreas cancer, and there's very promising data uh, in melanoma as well for these cancer vaccines. So I think it's reasonable to be excited about those. What about some off-the-wall ideas? What about really new stuff? Uh, and someone asked a question about CAR T cells. CAR T cells in solid cancers have been really difficult because CAR T is all about targeting. You've got to target those T cells. And it's been hard to find um, cells which only are express only ex uh, which are only expressed on cancer, sorry, to find proteins that are only expressed on cancer, the target that are not expressed on normal tissue. That's easier in hematological cancer. And actually, we've not had huge amounts of success with CAR T cells in, um, um, in kidney cancer. There are two final targets in the future I'd like to talk about. The first is the microbiome. Um, we all have hundreds of trillions of bacteria in our gut. And the gut interacts with the immune system. 
So, for example, when you take antibiotics, the reason you get diarrhea is because in the gut where the antibiotic is, it's killing lots of the back, a lot of the uh, um, of the bacteria there, and the immune system is being altered by those um, antibiotics. And we know actually that if you augment the immune system, uh, you, it looks like you can get a form of immune response. And we know from some retrospective data that if you take antibiotics while you're on immune checkpoint inhibition, you appear to do slightly less well. And so there are drugs like CBM588, and there's a small randomized phase two, which suggests by augmenting the microbiome, by making more good bacteria in your gut, you can augment your immune system, fight the cancer more effectively. I think it's a very interesting area of cancer research, and I'd really like to do that work in uh, kidney cancer. It's been very hard to do that. And then the last area are the radial ligands. Um, we know that um, we can uh, target CA9. We've talked about that before. And you can put uh, a radioisotope on that potentially, and that could be toxic. And it would be a way of giving essentially targeted um, radiotherapy uh, or indeed targeted immune therapy by CA9. And I think this radio ligand approach, which is popular currently in prostate cancer um, with lutetium, I think we can do the same potentially in kidney cancer in the future. So two parts to the story. Great success for so far, but we've reached a plateau with PD-1 and indeed with VEGF, in my opinion. And I think this adjuvant positive trial is the icing on the cake for that. And I think we've really reached the end of that journey, in my opinion. And then the next story, well, we've got a series of phase one experiments, a series of hopeful targets, but we don't have lots of new randomized phase three, like in bladder or in prostate cancers, which we hope are going to come out soon with novel targets, which we think is going to be the next chapter as it currently stands. The last piece, which I am going to talk about very, very briefly, Brian, I can see you I'm chatting too long, is about biomarkers. We've not been good at development of biomarkers in kidney cancer. It's really disappointing to me. We're beginning to get better at it, but we really need to try harder. Thanks, Tom. Speaking of Toms, we have a Tom queued up to ask a question. Go ahead. You're muted it to say you know. There you go. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor, and thank you, Doctor. I'm actually reading a question uh, for Eric from Michigan. What are the upcoming trials that we should really keep an eye on? I mean, um, go ahead, Tom. Well, um, you far away, Brian. You go. I mean, I think if you said what you know, the next trials that'll impact kidney cancer. Tom mentioned there's some. Uh, one big triplet trial, so a trial giving three drugs instead of the standard of care two. Merck has a big sponsored trial that probably in the next, I don't know, one to two years, we should have results. There's still an adjuvant trial out there. You know, I don't know that it'll impact the field that much, but it's out there. There's a, a European trial looking at a nivolumab with or without ipilimumab, which we find interesting because there's some question around what the ipilimumab is adding. I don't know. Other big trials, Tom? I can't think of anything Entivo? really big. Is it Entivo? Uh, Tenevo 2 is a trial looking oh. at continuing immune therapy <laughs> after patients have already been through immune therapy. And there's been one trial that didn't show benefit. And I think most people feel the second one won't show either. So I think what Tom alluded to is a lot of early work in vaccines and early phase trials. But in terms of like the big practice changing trials, I think we may have a couple of years. We may have a little bit of a lull between those. Um, yeah. Hey, Tom, if it's okay with you, both times, I guess, I don't know if we have other questions. I was going to try and I, I was looking through the um, the chat for some themes on bat questions. On. Bat on, Brian, bat on. People, people asked, if you get adjuvant therapy, does it affect how you're treated if you have recurrence? And the answer is yes, probably, but we don't really know. So if somebody had a year of pembrolizumab and unfortunately recurred despite that, we really have no idea how to treat that patient, would immune therapy work again? These are the questions that the field is asking each other. So it's a great question. We'll figure it out over the next few years. Um, a couple of questions about chromophobe. That slide I had put up was just papillary. I just pulled it from a slide set. Chromophobe is 
especially challenging. It's first of all, exceedingly rare, but especially challenging because it doesn't seem to respond as well to immune therapy for reasons we don't understand. So while we still tend to use some of the same regimens, I think um, they're a little less reliable in chromophobe. And then maybe last one, unless you want to say something, Tom, go ahead. We've got 93 questions, Brian. No, I'm, I'm summarizing. I'm summarizing. <laughs> um, somebody asked about avoiding TKI toxicity long term. I think everybody in the field is interested in that. And we just need to do better studies to show that you can stop it or you can hold it. Every patient I have on TKIs takes breaks. And if, if you're on a TKI and you're not taking regular breaks, like three-day breaks, ask your doc about it because, in my opinion, you should be. Every single Brian, patient I have. what do you think about giving 12 weeks of Axipembro and then after 12 weeks doing Belzutifan Pembro? Sure. Well, we got to do a trial, though. I wouldn't just do it. No, no, sure. But do you think it's a good, do you think it's a nice idea? Yeah, for sure. Well, let's do for it. Sure. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, I think better tolerated than, than axisinib, I suspect. Yeah. So I think what that's getting at that we don't know yet is can a drug like Belzutifan replace VEGF TKIs? There's trials of them in combination that some of that data looks promising, but what Tom's getting at is there a way to sort of do a bait and switch and give people the maybe more potent but more toxic drugs up front and then switch to a, a kinder, gentler version for quote unquote maintenance. And I hope we'll see those trials. I don't, I'm not aware of any, but I, I hope we'll see them. I uh, saw a question about lenvatinib and everolimus. I think from my perspective, I think that combinations, I think frontline combinations, Ipinevo, VEGF, TKI, PD-1, I think they've become a standard and I think that's reasonable. I think after that, there aren't any other combinations that clearly are of benefit. So, you know, lenvatinib and pembrolizumab third line, I don't think it's a great idea. We've tested it in clinical trials without great success in my experience. Um, and Limbatinib and Everolimus, um, you know, um, Atezolizumab and Cabozafinib, all of these combinations that currently stand, I wouldn't use them in the standard of care. So the only combinations I would be using is the far frontline um, combinations that we use. But there are some combination trials which I'm interested in. There's a lenvatinib belzutifan trial, um, and I think that's versus cabozatinib, and I think that's in heavily pretreated disease, and um, and I think that that's a study which I'm excited about. And if you said to me which of all the studies out there, I think is most likely to be positive, I think it might be that Brian. You know, which one? I'm sorry, cabo belzutifan. Sorry, lenvatinib belzutifan versus cabo. Um, I think there's a chance that might be positive. I don't think it's yeah. going to be groundbreaking. I don't think it's going to cure yeah. hundreds of patients, but I think there may be a PFS advantage in that. I don't, I don't disagree. Okay. Um, somebody asked a very good question. If 8Y8 is neg ever reads out and it's negative, <laughs> this person must be listening to you on the podcast. What will happen to Ipi Nevo given the Checkmate eight-year data? I don't know. I have a feeling it's a smaller trial. It's like 450 patients. I have a feeling the trial will come out. It'll show some differences. They won't be overwhelming. I don't know if the statistics will be significant or not, and it won't change much in the field, unfortunately. So I think it's going to be a missed opportunity, but we'll see if, if we ever see that data, which we eventually will. I hope I'm still working when that happens. Um, you know, we'll see. Uh, yes, yeah, so we I definitely need a, a non clear cell town hall. We can't cover all the non clear cell. <laughs> Go ahead, Tom. The AYA story and the Nevo story is something which I'm talking about uh, because if IP Nevo was spectacularly active and IP was absolutely crucial, I think we would have seen some signal, at least a trend in the adjuvant IP Nevo trial. Now, I realize it's a shorter period of therapy. It's only six months. And I know people say, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I know Han said this, you know, the, 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 the adjuvant space is different. But, you know, the way I'm looking at the disease at the moment is different from perhaps 10 years ago, where you had metastatic disease and all of those patients, I'm afraid, died. And then we had perioperative disease where you had an operation, patients were described as being cured, but then miraculously, or not miraculously, tragically, the cancer returns in some. I'm actually seeing the cancer in three ways now. Number one is like 30 years ago, where we only had x-rays, 
which was symptomatic disease, metastatic symptomatic disease, where we do x-rays and show big lumps. Then we had progress where we had asymptomatic patients, but CT scans where we could identify small lumps, about one and a half centimeters. And many of those patients were asymptomatic. And many of those patients, the metastatic was picked up post-operatively, those adjuvant relapses. And now I think there's a third group of patients which have radiologically negative disease. We can't see it on a CT scan, but we can identify circulating blood cells or circulating cancer DNA. And these patients are asymptomatic, so they are blood test positive, radiology negative. And those patients should have been, if you gave them ipinevo, those patients should have been, you know, should have had a big benefit with ipinevo. And we didn't see that in 914. And so I'm a great believer in nivolumab. I think it's a great drug. I'm not yet convinced that IP is adding as much as many people think. And I think 8Y8 is an important study for that reason. I think Brian's coming on to. You see, you're asking me to stop to talking. Stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, thank you so much. That was really awesome. Uh, it was really fun to listen to you, to you all um, discuss these really interesting topics. And first of all, I want to say thank you to the audience for joining us tonight. Um, but also, real quick, Brian and Tom, can you tell us how you got the name Mira Amigos, real quick? Before you answer um, that, Brian, can you tell us why you got Map of Scotland on the back of your door? <laughs> uh, that's uh, you can talk to my grandparents and great grandparents from the Isle of Luz. <laughs> Very nice too. Very nice too. I don't uh, know. Chris Sweeney claims to have come with an, up with the name Your Amigos, but I'm not sure that that's true. No, that's um, not true. I, I don't think that's true. I, I think we. I, I was at an airport, uh, and uh, you and me and Chris were on the phone together, and uh, and I think we came up with the name together. Great, great. Well, thank you for that. And thank you to our sponsors, ASIX, Lixis, and Merck. And if you'd like to re-watch this town hall or share it with your family or friends, it'll be available on our YouTube channel, hopefully by the end of this week. Um, once the video is uploaded, we'll be uh, sending out an email to folks to uh, hook up to the video link. So thanks for that. And then our, our next town hall is scheduled for April 23rd. It's going to be clinical trials, a patient's perspective. And so hope you can put that on your calendar April 23rd. And I'd be remiss if I didn't have a call to action for our spring advocacy days. We're sending some folks and we're all going down to DC and we're also going to be there virtually um, this coming March. So you can go onto the Kidney Can website and register there. Please do. Uh, we need the we need the voices on Capitol Hill. Um, right after this, we're going to have a community social for those who want to join and just talk about tonight. Um, it's in a Zoom link that was sent earlier. Um, with that note, um, Tom, Brian, really, really appreciate your time tonight. Thank you so much. Got sure. 90 some questions. We'll figure out a way to, to, <laughs> to deal with them and we'll be back. Send them to us. Yeah, we're well, happy to answer. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks. Good to be here.